Uh, good morning and good afternoon. This is Kimberly with Stroudwater from our Portland, Maine office. Uh, thank you for joining us this afternoon for our webinar on demand-based staffing. Um, a couple of housekeeping items right at the top. Uh, yes, we will send the materials for this webinar as well as the recording after the event. Um, and a few of you were good enough to send some advanced questions. We will be getting to those a little later on in the session. And if anything comes up to you during um, the webinar, you can use the chat box um, to ask questions and we'll get to those as we can. Uh, give you a little bit of a background on Stroudwater briefly. We are a leading national healthcare consulting firm serving healthcare clients exclusively. We focus on strategic, operational, and financial areas where our perspective offers the highest value. We're proud of our 34-year track record with rural hospitals, community hospitals, health systems, and large physician groups. With that, I'd like to introduce you to your presenters, speakers, experts today. Um, we are represented uh, from Maine to Atlanta to Houston. Um, first up is Ron Hughes. He's a senior advisor with Stroudwater. He has more than a quarter century of experience working directly with frontline managers and staff in both unionized and non-unionized hospitals to train, teach, and partner with organizations to realize more efficient staffing practices. Again, uh, Ron is in Houston. Um, Lan Nguyen is a consultant out of our Atlanta office. She's a member of Stroudwater's demand-based staffing team. She has a strong background in finance, analytics, and process improvement, as well as extensive experience in enhancing quality outcomes through effective leveraging of data and organizational change. Uh, lastly, in our Atlanta office, but on the road today, uh, Ryan Sprinkle is a practice leader in Stroudwater's performance improvement service line. Ryan has worked with multiple healthcare organiza organizations to identify performance improvement opportunities and develop turnaround plans, and then manage the team in assisting clients to implement those plans. So that's our crew for today. And um, while we are waiting for them to queue up, we're going to start with a poll question to make sure that you are all awake. Um, and we will do a little interactive poll here. Which best describes your organization? Hospital PPS, a call hospital, a health system made up of many uh, providers and hospitals, a physician clinic, or other? You can go ahead and chime in there. Put your sandwich down for just a second. Um, we've got 40% coming in as CA, 25% uh, health systems so far. We'll give this just a few more seconds for people to engage. And then we will turn it over to um, Ryan to kick us off. All right, so I'm going to show the results there. We have 40% cause and 24% health systems represented um, on the phone today. Ryan? Great. Well, uh, thank you very much, Kimberly, for kicking us off. Um, as Kimberly shared, I'm Ryan Sprinkle. And uh, we uh, thank you for giving us your, your time today, whether it's your lunch hour or uh, any other time that you've carved out. We want to be respectful of your time and realize that many of you probably have questions that are probably of higher value than some of the content we're going to review. So we're going to try to march through um, our handful of slides here rather quickly in the next 15, 20 minutes and really reserve um, a good deal of time to answer any questions that, that you may have. So stick around with us. We'll try to get to the higher value content more quickly. Uh, so, you know, we just want to begin to help set the context in, in terms of asking, you know, why is there a need for enhancing labor productivity? Well, as I think many of you are, are well aware because you live this each and every day in your organizations, um, it's, it's becoming increasingly difficult to, to make money, to generate um, cash flow or make any profit off of off your operations. 
Uh, Medicare, which at best covers cost, um, is projected to, to trend negative for most health systems um, today and over the next the course of the next several years um, based upon a more recent MedPAC study. So uh, you're not going to get any relief um, from the government payers in trying to cover your costs as an organization. And so that really causes you to have to look at other levers um, to grow revenue and contain and control expenses. Uh, the industry as a whole uh, is also in, in, a, in a rather difficult pos position today. Both Moody's and Fitch, um, two different rating agencies, have provided a negative outlook um, here for the nonprofit healthcare and hospital sector in 2019. And uh, what, again, what you're seeing and experiencing is exactly what Moody's and Fitch and, and other raters, uh, rating agencies have, have reflected in the guidance that they've given to the street. Uh, operating costs continue to, to increase and outpace um, any increases in revenue, and that just is causing your overall operations um, to be more difficult. Uh, you know, outside of uh, that literally macro level analysis, we know more discreetly what some of those drivers are. So the ongoing decline in reimbursement, um, both from, uh, you know, as we've reflected on Medicare rates that aren't keeping pace with the increases in other operating costs, um, on down to private payers, commercial contracts, which are getting uh, more hesitant to pay for different types of services and um, exceptionally hesitant on providing any enhanced reimbursements. On average, um, labor as a operating expense, um, you, you guys are well aware, represents anywhere from 50%, 50 to 60 percent of your total operating expenses. So as you're dealing with constraints on revenue growth and continued increases in other sources of operating expenses, it becomes hard not to look at labor as a indicator or as an opportunity for trying to better titrate or control the overall overall expense structure in the organization. What we have found working with different clients of various uh, sizes and scales is that, you know, by moving your labor system from one that's more of a fixed to a variable workforce that better matches and reflects the changing um, demand that you're experiencing for services, uh, that really can drive a 10 to 15 percent improvement in labor costs for any organization. And this is not necessarily something that only exists for large systems, but uh, increasingly uh, we're getting a lot of phone calls from, from smaller healthcare organizations, but smaller um, PPS and smaller um, critical access hospitals that are looking for opportunities to enhance their operating efficiency, specifically looking at labor productivity. Well, um, this is Ryan. Go ahead, Ron. I was going to um, tee up another uh, poll question, if that's all right with you. Well, let's do that. Excellent. All right. I'm launching it now. Um, does your organization adjust its budgeted staffing expenses based on changes in forecasted volume That's um, rather than a fixed budget? Yes, no, not sure. Um, say what? What's the difference? Um, give everybody a few seconds to opine on this. Um, we're coming in at so almost 50% on yes. Split right down the middle now, yes and no. Give all the attendees just a moment. And we'll close out of this. Fair warning. All right. So... It looks like 48% of you are um, adjusting your budget um, based on um, forecasted volume. 44% are not, and 8% aren't quite sure. Back to you, Ron. Thank you. Well, thanks. This is Ron Hughes, and I'm truly excited to be a presenter on this webinar. Um, anyone on this uh, broadcast that knows me knows the passion I have for this subject. Any organization that does not have a management planning and control systems and tools that plan, sign, and monitor the work to workers on a ship-by-ship, day-by-day basis will improve their provider satisfaction, quality, workplace environment, 
and do it more cost effectively just by implementing the system. Our clients experience labor cost reductions on an average of 15% by having workers at the right place at the right time. This is achieved through forward management or demand-based staffing. Lan? Yeah, and before, before Lan jumps in here, Ron, you know, I wanted just to highlight a recent example that we've had working with a client to help them um, develop and then execute on this e exact type of system that, that you've described. So very recently, we had the opportunity to work with a $100 million net patient revenue hospital uh, in the south, uh, Southwest um, that was experiencing significant financial losses and had expressed to us a need to really come in and help them evaluate and then adjust their staffing levels to better match the, the demand, the cloning demand that they were facing. Um, you know, we recognize as, as a practice and as a, as a group of, of professionals that the greatest source of value that we can provide to our clients in a performance improvement context really rests in our ability to quickly get our clients into that implementation or execution phase. And so we've specifically tailored our approach to demand-based staffing to help our clients make that rapid adjustment. So with this client, for instance, um, within a 12-week period, um, we had uh, performed that rapid assessment that allowed them to identify and quantify where the opportunities existed for enhancing productivity, um, provided them with the tools and resources that they then could use um, to execute and implement on those initiatives, and provided the training and assistance um, over that 12-week period to help the organization be more sustainable um, in deploying those uh, tools and resources uh, over the longer term. You know, this allowed um, that hospital in particular to, to realize a savings of about four and a half million dollars during the course of the first seven months. Um, and, and again, just because we're committed to helping our clients sustain these results and different from uh, what we see others do in the market, uh, when we're working with a client on a demand-based staffing um, set of opportunities, uh, we uh, develop and embed the tools and resources that um, these organizations rely upon to continue that work long after we're gone. It becomes something that sits inside of your systems, um, becomes tools that are handy and a part of the process that your frontline managers um, will use um, in the months and years thereafter because we really are committed to making sure our clients can sustain um, these enhancements and improvements. And overall, and, and as I make the transition here to allow our colleague Land to share some time with, with everyone, you know, we really have uh, thought about this approach to helping organizations make that pivot to a more demand-based staffing system in terms of three primary um, buckets of activities. First being that, that rapid diagnostic, followed by the actual development, design, and implementation of the system. And then the last component, which is really focused on the uh, truly important factor of realizing sustainability through ensuring that um, local resources are properly uh, trained and equipped to continue those positive results um, for the period thereafter. Lan? Good afternoon, everyone. This is Lan. Um, I've been very fortunate in that I've been able to use my background in analytics and finance to help clients in the past with uh, their patient safety and satisfaction and quality scores, and I've been very fortunate to continue to use that uh, background here at Stroudwater to help clients um, do the same thing, but uh, with their their staffing. Um, so as Ryan said, the the big three buckets that we have are uh, in identifying and quantifying the opportunity. Um, excuse me. Um, in this very first phase of the project, our goal is to understand the current state of labor processes at an organization to identify and start to quantify whatever um, opportunities there are for some productivity enhancement. We do this in two major ways, uh, both quantitatively and qualitatively. Quantitatively, um, we will gather data from an organization, so this will be their historical data, uh, typically financials. And what we've noticed is that organizations typically are uh, accustomed to looking at staffing in terms of budgeted dollars or uh, FTEs or paid hours. 
it's more uncommon for us to see organizations who look at their staffing in terms of works or productive hours. Uh, we also tend to notice that organizations look at their budgeted dollars and try to compare it to some kind of revenue figure to determine some kind of ROI. And while that's very important, uh, especially for us to look at that financially, those types of metrics are really hard for managers to manage towards and against. Um, so what we do in this translation process is we'll take an organization's financial data and uh, compare their work hours towards a volume statistic or some other measure of success for that cost center. And what this begins to give us is more of a productivity metric. We refer to this as um, our worst hours per unit of service. And using this productivity uh, metric, managers can actually start to manage uh, their worked hours, whatever labor they've got within their, uh, their cost center to some kind of volume or success metric. Uh, we also, during this phase, will talk to managers and start to uh, understand what the current processes there are in place for labor management, if there's any uh, kind of process or systems around how to assign workload to work, and then if there are any uh, reporting and control tools within the organization that help them in this process. Uh, so that's where we start to identify and start to see if there's any opportunity for improvement within uh, the organization. Thank and you, Lynn. Uh, oh, sorry, didn't mean to interrupt you. Go ahead. I was going to jump in with a poll uh, question right now. Um, we are going to ask everyone, does your organization use a productivity report that measures volume against staffing levels for each pay period? Yes, no, or not sure. Um, got everybody has their fingers awake. That's good. Um, got about 35 to 40% saying yes right now. 40% no and about 15% on shore. Give everyone just a few more seconds to share their opinion about their particular organization. All right, close out of that and share the results. It looks like we've got yes at 45%, no at 41% and unsure at 14 percent. All right, back to you, Lynn. In uh, the second phase of the project, uh, we begin to introduce tools and resources to the organization so that uh, that cost center department or the organization can begin to move towards a demand-based staffing model uh, and start to monitor that data. There uh, is typically a misconception when it comes to any staffing initiative or engagement, and that is that that means some kind of layoffs or a reduction in the labor force at that organization, and that's not necessarily the case. So it's incredibly important during this phase of the project to create a common understanding for all the stakeholders involved, whether it be staff or the frontline managers or administration around the productivity metrics that are being measured, uh, what those mean, how we can impact them, and the goals and objectives for the organization, whether they be financial or quality related or anything else. Um, during this phase of the project, we'll begin to collaborate with the managers to help them choose and understand their initial performance goal. Uh, this is typically an internal metric that we help them choose. And that's a little bit unique from other organizations in that typically a goal is chosen based on some kind of national or outsider metric. Um, but for our staffing engagements, uh, we choose an internal one because we think it makes a lot more sense to uh, benchmark against our own performance and uh, create goals that make sense for our organization internally. Um, and then once we've begun to uh, create that common understanding and have chosen some internal goals, that's when we'll start to implement uh, some systems and start to monitor and track data to move us, this organization, towards uh, a workforce that responds and flexes to its demand for services. The last phase of the project, the last couple of weeks, is uh, towards realizing sustainability. 
And this is incredibly important because no organization wants to rely on another one uh, in order to make improvements. So during this phase of the project, uh, we'll sit down with a client based on the data that we've gathered and uh, the rest of the project. We'll begin to identify any barriers or catalysts to uh, greater efficiency um, and help provide some processes around that. Uh, this is where we'll help the organization form a performance improvement team. And this team is tasked internally with addressing and removing those barriers and helping their organization succeed and become more efficient. Uh, in this process um, and stage of the project, we'll also empower this PI team with the processes, tools, authority, and everything that they need in order to make changes within their organization to continue to realize some of these productivity enhancements. Thank you, Lynn. Um, last poll question from Portland, Maine today. We will let's launch this puppy. Okay. Do your frontline managers forward manage and staff units based on anticipated volume? Uh, yes, yes, but we still experience issues in flexing staff on and off. No, we're unsure. Looks like everybody it's split between um, where it is implemented but still experiencing issues and not forward managing so far. So we'll give people a couple more seconds to put in their answer. We're up to 62% that say yes, but still experiencing issues. All right, we'll close out of this and share the responses. Um, yes at 8%, yes but still experiencing issues, 62%, and no, 31%. All right, that's it for poll. So this is Ron again, and I mentioned earlier that I had a, a passion for this. Uh, I have a passion for your frontline managers. Uh, enhancing staffing productivity is won or lost with your frontline managers. Um, your line managers and directors are good clinicians and technicians, but were they given the management tools and concepts needed when they stepped up into their management positions? Um, equipping and empowering frontline managers with the necessary tools and resources to track and enhance productivity is central to developing a demand-based staffing. The Stroudwater 12-week implementation just described by land does this. When completed, you will have the management planning and control systems where you plan, assign, and monitor the work to workers in short intervals of time. Okay, creating and leveraging open communications to share challenges or barriers to enhancing productivity within and across departments is crucial to moving the organizations forward. Many times we hear, we can't do what we do the way we have to do it with any less people. And we tell them we understand. But let's now focus on the way we have to do it. Barriers, or also known as limiting conditions, are processes, policies, methodologies, and sometimes culture that block them from being more productive. A lot of times you'll hear, well, it's the way we've always done things. By identifying those barriers and working collaboratively with all of the stakeholders, many of these limiting conditions can be removed. Providing transparent information about the, and identifying productivity goals and financial impacts from reaching those goals better motivates teams and positively impacts behavior. When performance goals or stretch targets are established and departments succeed or fail to achieve those targets and are made transparent to all stakeholders, teams are motivated to help each other and achieve those organization goals. It's a challenge to convince a frontline manager that this really works, but you can show them. Install the Stroud Water Shift Management Tools and the Pay Period Performance Tracker and watch the discoveries and management change. That's great. Thank, thank you, Ron. Um, 
you know, so we've uh, we've tried to hold to our promise here to get done in, in 20 minutes. Uh, thank you for sticking around and, and giving us a little bit of grace and going over. Uh, I think what we'd like to do now is pivot to um, a Q&A section. And um, uh, Kimberly, I believe you have some of the questions that some of our attendees today submitted in advance. Is that correct? That is correct, Ryan. Um, we ha uh, when people registered, we asked if they had any questions so we could be prepared um, in advance. And then we also have some people who have asked questions live. Um, so let me uh, start with the first one. Is there a commonly used staffing matrix for a critical access hospital that uh, does quite a bit of ortho surgeries as well as obstetrics? Uh, this is Ron. Um, that's actually, um, we have a number of questions along those lines. And when we start getting down to smaller organizations uh, and critical access hospitals, and, and for years I've, I've worked with them, um, you, you hear, well, is, is there a minute? We have minimum staffing, we have core staffing levels. Well, the you do, but, but let's get into semantics here. A minimum staffing, a clinical or a safety minimum staffing, in other words, if we just have one patient in the hospital, what's the minimum people that have to be in these different areas? It can be different than a core staffing that's based on your staff qualification or staff uh, determination. In other words, if all of your staff are full-time employees that need 40 hours worth of work in a week, then that kind of becomes your core staffing. It, you need, we need to dig down a little bit into this and really identify the difference between clinical minimal staffing and maybe what your core staffing is. But setting up a master staffing schedule around what your true needs are, be it orthopedic or you know a lot of urgent care, is an exercise that needs to be undertaken and basically monitored on a day by day, week by day, week basis. It's a challenge when you get into the smaller organizations. That kind of answered it, but there are matrices of, of other critical access hospitals that are similar to you that we can bring in, but really it's about what, what are your needs and what are your true clinical uh, limiting uh, staffing versus your um, poor staffing because of the, the type of employees you have. All right, um, the next question. Um, this is uh, for an organization with more than 700 beds. Would you recommend a centralized staffing approach for this size organization? Ryan, why don't you take that one? Yeah, well, I, I think uh, the, you know, so the system that, that we're utilizing here is one that we're pretty well convinced uh, can and has been utilized in, in organizations 700 beds of size in north as well as smaller sized organizations. Um, you know, the, so there's typically two, two options that we have when we're working with a client um, to help them with a, um, a staffing engagement. One is to, is to go external and look at benchmarks that are from a, you know, a set of peers and see how our client um, uh, performs from a productivity perspective in specific cost centers relative to the peer or cohort. Um, when we do that work, um, you know, we will spend time to develop um, uh, the, the cohort, accumulate the data, and, and then to be frank with, with our audience, we'll, we'll spend the better part of, of a month to two months having an extended conversation with hospital leadership on why this hospital or that hospital in the cohort isn't exactly exactly a good fit for um, the client. Uh, you know, we we like to to you know avoid that time and delay, and instead, I think as Lan shared previously, ask ourselves how well have we staffed this organization in the past compared to ourselves. So looking at current state productivity levels across different cost centers. And comparing that to previously achieved levels of productivity over the course of the past year, how well are we uh, staffing and um, being productive in our different cost centers today compared to prior points in the past? And when we do that, it, it sets up not a question of you know uh, how do you know 
why is this organization included for comparing us against ourselves uh, versus another but you know what are the barriers or the limiting conditions that are keeping us from being more efficient today than we were at some point in the past and, and that is you know the, the real magic in the process where we, we start to have these conversations within specific departments or cost centers around the initiatives or efforts that need to be under, undertaken to help them be more productive and efficient in their department. Um, I hope that answers the question. Um, it, it's really important from our perspective that, you know, for a, an organization to, you know, not to necessarily try and um, do a one-time approach to setting staffing levels, but for it to be more dynamic and fluid and really flex in a way that matches the, the volume that you're experiencing, that it be something that's embedded within specific cost centers. And we think the best way to do that is, is by having the organization compare itself against itself. Thank you, Ryan. Um, we have another question pertaining to um, situations where there are staff shortages, specifically nursing, asking if this approach can work in those staff shortage situations. Um, this is okay. Ron. It, oh, Elaine, go ahead, please. Yeah, um, I would actually argue that in instances where you have shortages, is where demand-based staffing would actually help you more. Uh, provider shortages is something that we're seeing across the country, across all, all organizations, and this is why staffing is uh, a hot topic. Um, for smaller organizations, especially, it's much harder to absorb uh, exuberant labor costs or that loss of revenue that's associated with uh, improper staffing. And the approach of demand-based staffing matches the volume that you've currently got to your current workforce. So for areas where there are uh, staffing shortages, it would make it easier to match uh, when you have to flex up in volume and staffing. Uh, it would make it easier to match that workload to the workforce at those times and figure out uh, if there are times where um, there's not as much volume, how you flex up and down to match the demand and the need for staff at those times. Ron, if you want to add anything. The, the only thing is we talk about limiting conditions and, and that's a real concern. If you basically have a need for a certain number of nurses in a given area and they really will not work for you unless they have a full time uh, 40 hour a week uh, job, then you have a tough limiting condition. It's real. You have to recognize it and it might not be something you can solve for. That's why sometimes the smaller organizations become more challenging to have a flexible workforce. But just by knowing what you would like your staffing to be next Thursday and whether you can get there or not because of your limiting condition of everybody needing a full time job. When somebody then calls in sick, you actually have a better idea if you really need to worry about replacing them or not. Um, th there are different tactics on, on these smaller areas, but no, if, if you're in a, uh, an area that, that it's hard to get the workforce and when you get them, they need to be full time, that's a true challenge. Thank you, Lynn and Ron. Um, one more question, well, we've got two more questions. Um, how does this model work in uh, specialty and primary care practices? Ron, I know you've been working more recently to deploy this or an augmentation of it inside of a um, inside of a clinic setting. Any any thoughts there on an application? Yes, the 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 first challenge is to truly understand. Um, what your labor needs are on a day-by-day -day basis. Um, it's shades of zero-based budgeting. Um, we have a tool that's called a master staffing schedule that really we sit down with each of the areas and really identify what the needs are on the morning session versus the afternoon session, on a Monday versus a Friday, and we literally model what the need is and we put it in this master staffing schedule, and then it tells you how many hours we really need to get the work done. And this, this tool also puts names in it. In other words, who's gonna come, or is this a per diem slot, or is this an individual slot? 
it, it's really very old school management. It's zero based budgeting. What do we need on a you know a session by session basis? It, it's it's kind of eye opening sometimes when you go through this exercise of how you basically develop your needs in these areas, and and then you put a schedule together, and every week you review your schedule and make sure that it still matches your needs, and you go week to week. Uh, we talk about managing day by day. In these kind of settings, maybe it's more like we need to manage and, and reevaluate week by week. Thank you, Ron. Um, and the last question we have um, pertains to the minimum staffing requirements at small rural hospitals. How does the demand-based staffing model work in these facilities? Well, we kind of talked about it a little earlier, but in, there are organizations that are too small for the, this approach to really have that much of an impact on. However, it's worth it to know what you should do to match work to workers on a day-by-day -day basis, and then whether you can do it or not is, is a, another challenge. But starting out with knowing what you really need to do, and over the years working with very small critical access hospitals, uh, Stroudwater has a tool and approach where we literally will uh, look at every department and identify what the true clinical or safety minimum staffing is if there's only one patient in that hospital, and at least understand what that is, and then be able to compare that to what you actually have coming in. Uh, it's a challenge but it's worth doing. And I know, I know we were at a uh, critical access hospital last week, uh, Ron, Lane and I um, doing this exact work. And it's, you know, it's, it's not only discovering through the data what the, um, what the opportunities may be for enhancing productivity, um, but it's, you know, teasing out through identifying those barriers or limiting conditions, other ways that the organization can be more efficient. So, you know, this, this client, as an example, um, you're talking to housekeeping, and uh, they were sharing that one of their struggles in being more efficient and productive is having to backtrack um, between clinical and non-clinical units um, over the course of the day. They, they know what their work requirements are on a on a daily basis for cleaning non-clinical rooms um, but it's when you know you have a, a patient discharge process that you know has patients being um, discharged from the med surge unit you know any hour every hour that really creates more of a resource need on their perspective so just in in that conversation um, you know we were able to identify that a real need for that organization to help make housekeeping more efficient and productive, and by extension, clinical units, was to develop a centralized patient discharge process so that whether it's 11, 11, 30, whatever the time is, um, all patients that are um, intended to be discharged that day have received their discharge papers and, and instructions, then the, uh, the housekeeping unit can come in right behind them and clean those rooms and, and flip them and make them ready for the next patient. And it has all sorts of downstream implications, not only for the, the clinical resources in the med surge unit, but patient flow in and through the ED as they're trying to admit patients. And overall, you know, it, again, it, it speaks uh, highly to an ability to use productivity and opportunities for enhancing efficiency to ultimately improve the patient experience and, and provider and staff satisfaction. Uh, this is Kimberly in Portland. We did have one more question come in if we have time. And um, that's regarding admin uh, departments. Is there a benchmark algorithm for admin departments or is that a different animal? I'll, I'll defer to uh, my, my, my two quantitative colleagues here to help share some of the, the metrics or parameters we use to evaluate those admin departments. Land, you take it. Um, so within the administrative departments, while we tend to not think of them the same way that we think of the clinical departments, there are units of measure that we can look at to also determine the productivity and flex a little bit based on that. Um, 
will notice like um, if your administrative duties change with the number of discharges or um, some some other variable, we can look at that and flex the staffing to make the rest of the organization more efficient as uh, Ryan was speaking to. So the process is, is similar, the metrics are a little bit different. I, um, a number of years ago, was working at a very large hospital in Phoenix and I loved it and I loved the CEO. And the CEO in, in a big productivity meeting, we were trying to get the productivity down. He says, you know what? He goes, if, if nurses have to flex the volume, if the procedural areas have to flex the bottom to volume, you know what? Us in administration are going to flex the volume too. And so if we, if we basically are tracking that the patient days or some volume indicator is going down, we're going to flex too. So, so I'm taking off uh, every Friday for the next month on PTO and, uh, and, and do our part. And he got almost a standing ovation across the whole room where they recognize that even there are no such thing as fixed departments. Everybody needs to flex to uh, the, the volumes. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, Lan, for, for answering that last question. Um, and that was our last question. Um, I want to put in a little plug before we say goodbye here uh, from the speakers. Um, we do have a podcast and we just put out a new one today, which you can get at stroudwater.com under podcast. And it's 20 minutes of uh, Ron and another one of our consultants really, really going into the nitty gritty on demand-based staffing. Um, so I do recommend that for those of you who want to dive a little deeper into this. Yeah, and I would, I would add to Kimberly, um, in addition to the podcast, which is um, pretty good content, um, We've got a, a Ron, Lynn, and, and I and others have uh, put out a lot of articles and other content really over the last seven to eight months about demand-based staffing. So um, feel free to head over to our website to look at some of that content as well. And if, uh, if any of the information we've shared today has been of value and uh, any of our attendees have further questions or would like to talk about their situations with us, um, feel free to reach out. Our contact information is here. You'll receive a copy of the of the slide deck over in the next day or so, and um, we'd we'd love to um, get on the phone with you and and help understand where your organization is at and, and what you're trying to do. All right. Well, for all of us um, at Stroud Water across the country, um, thank you so much for your time um, today, and we will follow up with the materials within the next 24 hours. Thank you.